Hello everyone, my name is Sarah Chen and I am the editor of the newsletter at the Asian Neuropsychological Association or ANA. As part of the Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month in the United States, we bring to you a series of five interviews and conversations with notable scholars and leaders in our field today, uh, which was inspired by similar work uh, from our colleagues at the Society for Black Neuropsychology. Special thanks goes out to Dr. Kendra Anderson for her help and guidance in this project. We'll be uploading a new video every Thursday in the month of May through the first week of June on our YouTube page, which is also where you'll be able to find our other videos. So do check those out. Our association will not be what it is today without the direction and support of those in our community. So as such, we welcome and invite comments, suggestions, and any insights you may have for our guests and our media team. You can bring these to our attention via email at the.ana.newsletter at gmail.com, or you can also tweet us at, at Asian Neuropsych. You can also check out our website at the ana. .org. Our third guest today is Dr. Uvashi Shah. Dr. Shah is a neuropsychologist specializing in seizures and epilepsy in the Department of Neurology at King Edward Memorial Hospital in Mumbai, one of the largest public hospitals in India. She completed her PhD in psychology from Bombay University in 1995, and since then she's gone on to set up the first Center for Neuropsychology Studies, or CNS, to make neuropsychological services much more accessible to those with low income. Her accomplishments are so many that I ran out of time speaking about them earlier in my recording, so I'll just mention a few that I think capture some of the breadth and the depth of the work that she has done in her career, including being a part of the Comprehensive Epilepsy Care Program in Mumbai, being an expert on the Indian Council of Medical Research to develop standardized protocols for neurocognitive tools in India, being a member of the Neuropsychology Task Force of the International League Against Epilepsy, or ILIA, and the Scientific Committee of the World Congress for Neurorehabilitation in India. And for her pioneering work in neuropsychology in Mumbai, she was awarded the prestigious Mayor's Achievement Award. Speaking to Dr. Shah today is Dr. Preeti Sundara Raman, who is part of the membership committee here at ANA. Dr. Sundara Raman is an associate research scientist in the Cognitive Neuroscience Division at Columbia University. She was a former NRSA postdoctoral research fellow who received the K99R00 award. She was born and raised in India and completed a major portion of her education there. After receiving her master's degree in clinical psychology from the University of Mumbai, she worked as a clinical psychologist conducting neuropsychological evaluations for patients with epilepsy and other neurological disorders. Like many of us, she moved to the United States for graduate school. Dr. Sundar Raman completed her PhD in clinical psychology, focusing on neuropsychology at Drexel University. Since then, she's been focused on enhancing her research and clinical competencies in concurrent areas, including decision-making research with a focus on financial decision-making and cross-cultural evaluations. Dr. Sundar Raman is fluent in English, Hindi, Marathi, and Tamil. And that is the end of my introduction this week. I'll let them take it away. It gives me great pleasure to uh, talk to Dr. Urvashi Shah today. I have known uh, Urvashi for about 20 years now. And uh, after completing my master's in uh, clinical psychology from the University of Mumbai, uh, I got introduced to Dr. Urvashi Shah and, and she introduced me to the whole field of neuropsychology. And she got me hooked to this field. Uh, she made me want to learn more and more. And honestly, I can go more and I can go on and on about how integral she's been uh, for my growth as a psychologist and more importantly as a human being. Therefore, it is my honor to um, show you all the multiple fascinating uh, facets that make Urvashi great. Yeah. Thank you, Priti. It's a real pleasure to do this interview. And I think it's a greater pleasure and I'm, I'm so delighted that it's you who are going to interview me. So it's always such a privilege when you've mentored or been with somebody to have the mentee come back in this position and then interview you. So thank you so much for doing this interview for me. Yeah, the pleasure is all mine and um, you know I'm happy to represent the Asian Neuropsychological Association. Okay, so... Um, uh, you know, yeah, I think, you know, one of the uh, questions that I think a lot of us have in our mind is what drew you to uh, neuropsychology? Uh, 
So it's really a long story, but I'll try and keep it brief. Uh, there's been a lot of serendipity in my life and how I got into neuropsychology. But essentially, I trained first as an occupational therapist. And while I was training in my undergraduate years, you have to remember this is a time I'm talking about, which is like the late 70s. So in that era, in at least in India, there was a lot of what I call neurological nihilism. There was always, we were taught when we were students that, yes, you can work with brain injury, but there's not much you're going to get out of it in terms of recovery. Yeah. And neurorehabilitation was what fascinated me. I, I would say I've loved the brain and I've been passionate about the brain even when I was a young student in school. And neurorehab was something that was totally what interested me when I joined occupational therapy, especially brain injury. And I was fascinated with this idea of how to recover function from a damaged brain. Mm -hmm. And then a series of events occurred, which I call serendipity, which drew me to neuropsychology. The first was that I chanced upon this book in our medical college library, which was by Kevin Walsh, mm -hmm. the grandfather of neuropsychology in Australia, and which was on the neuropsychology clinical approach, 1978 edition, the first edition. And I just fell in love with this book. And then at the same time, in the ward where I was posted, in the neurology ward, there was this uh, young, uh, school teacher from central India who had viral encephalitis. Both his hippocampi were damaged. And he had profound anterograde amnesia. But much to our surprise, even though he forgot me in like five minutes after I visited him, he could do his math lesson extremely well. And he demonstrated that to us. And we began to do a lot of rehabilitation work with him looking at procedural memory and how to recover that. So I think these series of events got me even more serious. And I began to think that it will be neuropsychology, really, which will give me the true window to the brain. And the rest, as they say, is history. I went on to do my master's and then a PhD thesis, which was on implicit and explicit memory systems. And then working in a head injury, brain injury, rehab program, epilepsy surgery program, dementia. And then began this phenomenal journey that I've had. Oh my so. gosh, it's it's, it's <laughs> truly phenomenal and so fascinating. And especially, I, I realized you're talking about a time when probably there was no infrastructure. So you know, for you to have paved the path uh, to kind of uh, have uh, neuropsychology create that field, uh, it's truly awesome. Um, uh, yeah, you know, and, and you know, it, it kind of brings me to like the next question. And we have talked a little bit about you know, the multitude of projects you're involved with. Uh, you know, can you tell us some of the projects that really fascinate you? So there have been many. I've been in the field now for over 25 years. And as you said, when I began in the city of Mumbai, for example, there was really nobody knew what neuropsychology was. The first part of the journey was to introduce the discipline, so to say, to the medical fraternity. And uh, neuropsychology is still in its nascent stage, you could say, in our country. And therefore, the funding for research has really not been there. But I think I have been fortunate to have had opportunities to participate in certain truly amazing projects over the years, plenty of them. But I think because we don't have that much time, I think I should focus on just a couple of them. So if I think that the phases of my career in the very early phase of my career, I had an amazing opportunity to participate in a project which came from the US. Mm -hmm. So it was an NIH-funded uh, study which Mount Sinai in New York mm -hmm. collaborated with us in India. Mm -hmm. And it was part of a public hospital in India, which I worked in, the Nair Hospital, where the project brief was that they had to come in and do capacity building in terms of the professionals here for dementia diagnosis. And we were looking at populations of people who we would be assessing for this diagnosis who were from the low income. Remember, this was a public hospital. So we see really the poorest of the poor. And these were low income and low literacy, low education groups of people. And they were elders. So the combination is one of the most difficult and the most challenging groups of people you can think of when you think of neuropsychological evaluations. So in this project, there were two arms. One was about strengthening the pathology arm. How do you, after the autopsies, recover that tissue and look at pathology in the brain and kind of have the clinical patho correlations. 
So that was one idea of strengthening the pathology group. The other was to strengthen the clinical diagnosis. And for that, we worked towards creating a very simple battery of tests. Because as I told you, we were evaluating a very challenging group. So it was a simple battery of screening tools that we put together. We were guided by the Mount Sinai team. Mm -hmm. And we went on to establish a memory clinic. Mm -hmm. The referrals were coming from psychogeriatric uh, OPD mm -hmm. as well as the neurology OPD. And we tried to use this battery of tests with them. And in parallel, we went into the community. Mm -hmm. There was a community where there was an NGO which had a place, like a little health center for the elders there. So we went in there into that NGO uh, kind of a, it was a small little room. And there we began to evaluate the community. Elders. So we had the community arm, we had the memory clinic arm, we had the pathology arm. And at the end of five years, it was a five-year long project. We um, published, and there was this is a very interesting paper. It's in the Journal of um, Alzheimer's Disease, International Journal of Alzheimer's Disease, which is characterizing the cognitive deficits in the elderly in urban Mumbai. Mm -hmm. So what were the kind of uh, deficits we saw and what were the issues? But more than those results, I think I, what I want to share when I talk about the projects is, what did I learn, my individual journey? What are the insights I developed which shaped me professionally and made me really understand what happens in India in neuropsychology? So I think the first extremely interesting observation when we were doing this project was, that when the elderly came in for the evaluation and we asked them how old they were, yeah. they had no clue. So they didn't know their birth date. They didn't know how old they were. And this is something subsequently also with the poor, and a lot of my work has been with the poor people and the low income groups and low literacy groups that I have encountered. Yeah. So this becomes a huge challenge. And so what we did then was we created a list of historical events, so in the in the kind of period that these people were their living life period, kind of mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like where the floods had occurred, or where the famines had occurred, or some major historical events, mm -hmm. and we are, and temporarily related to their personal milestones. So we would ask them if they had a memory of that event, yeah. and if they did, we would say, "Do you recall whether you were a young child or a teenager or older?" Yeah. And they estimated their age. So we use this methodology to be able to get how old they were. So this was very interesting for me as that it's a big barrier that even at the very first step, we don't know how old they are. The second thing that happened in this project was also we realized that a large number of them had vascular risk factors. In fact, our study showed that over 50% had hypertension and it was not, and quite a few of them were not even aware of it, especially in the community. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of comorbidity in terms of the vascular risk factors, which I think now, after so many years, we are very well aware that the Asian Indian communities have these risk factors and they produce a cognitive burden. Yeah. And when we think of dementia, and of course, this study later on showed us that when we looked at characterizing the types of dementia, we had the Alzheimer's at the top, but mm -hmm. in very close to it next for us was vascular dementias and then the mixed dementias. Mm -hmm. So this is a major factor for us. Yeah. I think the third thing that happened was that, um, you know, we also realized that people, when they came in uh, to our clinics, they came in very late in an advanced stage. Mm -hmm. They were not coming in early. And this we found quite interesting because we realized they come in only when basic ADL starts failing or they're showing significant behavioral problems. Mm -hmm. So families in India are not bringing in people with cognitive problems, the elderly, early enough. And it seems to be more from this culture of thinking that cognitive changes are a part of normal age. That's still very strong. And I just, day before yesterday, I had a very educated family who called me up and said, you know, their mother was really now paranoid, significant behavior problems. And then when I asked them, they said, oh, she's been forgetting and small things have been happening since four years. And have you seen a neurologist? No. And why haven't you seen a neurologist? Oh, we thought that it's just part of her aging and it's all right. Mm -hmm. So this is fairly common. So we don't really see them at an early stage. When we talk of MCI, we see a more sophisticated group of people 
who I see in private clinic who are more aware of people who are in high functioning positions in life yeah. and they experience the changes and want to do something about it that we see them early. But for the poor, the low income, low education group, we're seeing them quite late. So that was quite an eye opener. The other thing in the group, we found that quite a few of them had depression. There were mood changes. But if you ask them, that, are you sad? Do you have a problem? It's complete denial. Mm. And uh, it was, we really had to do a very in-depth clinical interview to kind of unravel or bring that out. Mm. And we realized that they present more with somatic complaints. So I'm not sleeping well, I'm not eating well, and then aches and pains mm-hmm. and other kind of somatic complaints. But if you ask them that, are you sad? Do you feel low? It's a no. Yeah. And this subsequently also, there's been a lot of work in India. We realize it's part of our culture. There's a denial of mood disturbances. There's a almost, and even when it is quite significant, I don't know whether it's a culture of being ashamed to admit that you are sad or you have a mood issue or a psychiatric problem, mm. or also you're not even relating to that emotionally. It's just the somatic complaints. Part. So I think that's one thing we bear in mind always when we are working with people about how do you elicit the mood issues and how do you say they're depressed or they're not, because there is a denial of that. Mm. And the other thing was also about the rapport building. Mm. So when you look at people from low income groups and you have to test them, They've never been in a testing situation. Mm. It's a complete lack of sophistication. And in India, we have this uh, whole uh, fear of exam and the word test. I'm sure you remember that from the audience. So it's, it's so ingrained in us that we have to perform really well if we're doing a test. So the minute we say it's a test, they're absolutely... So I think the word we use now is that stereotype threat. You know, they get completely overwhelmed and they underperform. So that how do we build a rapport with this group of people who've never been in this situation? Mm. So first of all, I think this was very interesting for me and I, I'm, I'm giving this example more because I know in the West, we, have, we talk about boundaries. We talk about formal formalities. Like when you're evaluating, there's a formal relationship with the person. In India, we break the boundaries. Mm. We just cross over. And we have a very intimate kind of a relationship with the person we are evaluating, the elders particularly. Yeah. So we never talked, asked, I mean, address them as Mr. or Mrs. or by their first name, never. In the Indian languages, we always use the terms which are relation terms. So we will call the elder woman as grandmother. Mm-hmm. The word in, like in Hindi will be Nani or Dadi or Aji in Marathi. Mm-hmm. So we will use that term or grandfather. Or we will use a term like elder brother or an elder sister. We have terms for a paternal aunt and even for a maternal aunt, which is different. So we use these terms of respect and relationship mm. to be able to first establish that rap. Yeah. So, and that, when we have allowed that to happen and the person is comfortable, can we go ahead? Yeah. Now, the other interesting thing, of course, is that we did have to modify even those small tests, we're talking about screening tools. And I think that most of you will be aware that like the MMSE in India has been changed. That was done in the Balakkar project long back in the 1990s, where with the rural, they modified the MMSE and made it the HX. So a lot of modifications had to be done. But the end point was we've realized that when we are assessing elders and low literacy people, you can reach a good diagnosis Mm. with using limited tests. But in addition, you must have a thorough clinical interview in the Mm. back. Unless you have your clinical history taken in depth, it doesn't work. But with a good clinical history, and if you have criteria, diagnostic criteria in front of you, Mm. and then like we did in the hospital there, we did consensus diagnosis. We sat as a multidisciplinary team and then discuss the findings, you can get away with small screening tools. Mm. So that was the first experience. The second experience of the second project was in my mid-career where a lot of learning happened. It was a drug trial. Mm -hmm. So this was a drug called phenobarbital. Mm -hmm. Phenobarbital is an anti-seizure medication. In India, we call it gardenal. 
So it's one of the oldest medications, been with us for many, many years, one of the earliest medications. In the West, it uh, had a lot of disrepute because there were a lot of papers coming out and talking about 30, 40 years ago that when the papers started 20, 30 years ago, where they said it has extremely negative side effects for cognition and behavior. Mm. So it went into disrepute and pretty much got out of the markets. But in India, we found, and the drug was always known to be extremely efficacious. Mm -hmm. It was efficacious. There was no doubt that it gave good seizure control. Mm -hmm. but it was very low cost. It was affordable. Mm -hmm. So for us in India, having a drug which is affordable was extremely important. Yeah. Because we have found that with our poor, if a drug is expensive, there is very poor compliance. They just don't take it. Yeah. So if we want seizure control, we have to it's a toss-up between tolerability, affordability, efficacy. Yeah. So we did this study, which was multi-center, national institutes were involved, mm -hmm. which was purely driven by the neuropsychologists to look at the cognitive side effects of the cognitive profile of this drug in our population. Mm -hmm. And we tracked, we did a baseline evaluation and then we did a one-year evaluation in newly diagnosed people with epilepsy to see its effect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, what we found after a year in our population, I mean, in this study, which was a multi-century trial, that we did not see the same results as that came out from the West. Mm -hmm. So we did not have any major impact on cognition. And in fact, we found that there was an improvement in psychosocial functioning on the very scales that we did. They were reporting improvements in their functions, their mood, and in other things. Mm -hmm. So I think what I learned from this was one is about this whole ethnicity and variability with ethnicity, mm. inter-ethnic variability that is there, mm. and uh, the response then to medication, mm. and the varying side effect profiles because of this inter-ethnic variability. Mm. And very often, you know, what we do is, and through my career from the beginning, we're so enamored by what is happening in the West, and because we didn't have the research, that you accept everything that comes from there. And that's true even of our tools. Yeah. When we start, we always pick up tools from the West, which have been developed for the Western populations. They yeah. educate what we call the weird population. Mm -hmm. And the Western educated yeah. industrial yeah. population. Yeah. And we try to just pick up that and apply it to ours. But when we do our own research, mm -hmm. we discover that that's not necessarily true. So... I think the huge learning for me was that we have to do our own studies and we have to do our own research. Yeah. And that's very important for us. And also from this study, a very interesting thing was about the using of scales. We use scales for mood and other things. And I realized that our groups, first of all, they cannot answer self-answer questions. Again, I'm talking about low income. They can't right. do it. Right. And then they get completely confused about the Likert scale. Right. You know that to some extent, to a larger extent, full extent, and the numbering. Yeah. So we have to convert those scales into visual analog scales. We also did what we call the rupee scale. So we asked mm -hmm. them, and that if I said it in the American way, in one dollar, how many cents do you get? So yeah. zeros would mean not at all, and a hundred cents would mean fully. Right. So we convert it into that system, and only then they can answer on the scale. Mm -hmm. So these were very interesting things we started learning from these projects. And last but not the least was very recently, the papers are still coming out, mm -hmm. not come out fully, four papers have been published so far, is that our own government organization, the Indian Council of Medical Research, for the very first time, mm -hmm. gave us a grant to create a toolbox mm -hmm. for, again, MCI and vascular dementia and dementia diagnosis. Mm -hmm. a neuropsychological battery toolbox. So we have created that. I was an expert in that project. I haven't done hands-on work. Mm -hmm. But from there, what we've learned after that experience is that one, it was in five languages. I think that was the interesting part of this project. So one, we learned that you can maintain the validity of the construct despite translating into multiple languages. We have learned that. So that was a great finding. The second thing we've learned is that, uh, you know, the monolinguals and bilinguals are performing in the same way. That was very interesting because we have multilingualism in our country and we've always been curious about that. 
Other lessons we learned is that we tried to make in tests for the illiterates, but those tests don't seem to have worked. And I have some thoughts about that. Maybe we'll talk about that later. And uh, finally, what was interesting for me to see in this project is that we're still working on it, is that when we think of a pan-India single norms mm. for the whole of India, mm. that's not working much. And there's been a variability of performance across regions. Mm. You still have to understand that possibly because of their same cultural differences, which may come in. Mm. So because of India being so diverse, yeah. we're not going to be able to achieve that. That's an important learning for us that we may not ever have Pan India or Pan country, you know, norms and which will work. We may have to think region wise. Right. right. So, this is some of the sharings and learnings I've had with some of these projects. Yeah. It's, it's so interesting. It's so interesting. It's, it's all the vast. And, and I love how you kind of broke it down by the stage of career that you were in and the lessons that you learned. And they've stayed there. Like it's not changed much. So, you know, it, it just shows that it's such a uh, rich learning. And, and, you know, I hope we all can kind of learn from these experiences. Uh, you know, it was interesting, uh, you know, in the third project, you kind of mentioned the, uh, that, uh, you know, India being multilingual. And that there can't be like a general national set of norms that can apply to all the different regions. This just kind of makes me wonder that, you know, with such diversity, like how do you see patients clinically? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so look at the diversity of India. We are right now 1.37 billion people. Okay. And uh, in terms of the diversity, I think. One third are still below the poverty line. We have 22 official official languages, but multiple more languages that are out there. Hundreds of dialects, multiple writing systems. So when we talk about language and communication, we also have still one of the world's largest groups of illiterate people. Yeah. So over 30 million or maybe even more yeah, are illiterate still. Yeah. Over 70% of the people are still living in the villages. Mm. So when we speak of India, and I think the experience in the US when you see people from India, you're seeing a certain, I think two groups. One is the very elite group who come yeah. and work there. And they don't really represent, in the sense, India, the India that I'm talking about in terms of our challenges with diversity and neuropsychological assessment. Yeah. So in India, our main challenges when we do neuropsychological evaluations comes from three factors. One is the education factor, the language, the multilingualism, and of course the socioeconomic factor because then there is poor exposure when you're from the lower socioeconomic class and uh, also you have less sophistication, test taking, etc. Yeah. So if I break this down in terms of experience when I'm actually doing an evaluation, if I look at the first step, and that is, of course, about being able to administer the test. Mm -hmm. And so when I have to administer the test, the first challenge comes from the language. Okay. So we always joke uh, that a prerequisite in India, it's not your degree or PhD degree or whatever, is that you have to know a couple of languages. So if you interview people, <laughs> besides the degree, you have to say, okay, how many languages do you know? So, for example, I am fluent in five languages. And there will be a typical day of mine where I'll go through at least three to four languages in, in a day. Yeah. And there have been situations where within the room, and I still remember this example that Dr. Aladi, who's a cognitive neurologist, used to share with us yeah. of how in a room she will have a patient, the caregiver, the young psychologist who's assessing, she is a neurologist. And between the four of them, they're speaking four languages in simultaneously. So one is just going through all those languages without even thinking about it. So uh, we have to know these languages. We have to assess in multiple languages. I think that's one way diversity uh, affects us, that we have to know this. In terms of interpreters, rarely do we use interpreters because we know most of the languages. If we don't, we will tend to use um, other students, colleagues in the hospital, or you know, nurses, the others come in. Very rarely have we had to involve professional interpreters. I think in my own 
25 years it's been once mm -hmm. but otherwise it's more about involving the family mm -hmm. but involving the family means we have detailed uh, prior kind of prep with the family doing all the translations prepping them training them so to say of how they will do it and then involving them as interpreters but by and large we do manage over our own. So language is a problem. Yeah. The next thing is in the administration when we are actually administering the tests is we find that with the low income group and also the less educated, there's a lot of elaboration of the instructions. Mm. So we often say in India that it's very difficult for us to standardize the instruction given yeah. or the format because depending on the individual in front of you, we uh, we elaborate on the instructions and repeat them several times until we are sure that the person is following what we do. Right. Also, we have to, as, as I described earlier, put that person at total ease. So a lot of time is set, spent in making them comfortable, as I told you, addressing them the right way, getting yeah. them there, explaining to them why we're doing it. So that those are... Uh, a ways in which we have to, ex you know, that diversity has to be addressed when there are different kind of clients from different backgrounds. Yeah. And then really we come to the norms. So when in the norms and education, what was very interesting for me was like two groups I discussed with you. I'll just share it. So when we were working in the epilepsy surgery program, we would get these young adults who would come from uh, semi-rural and rural India. Mm -hmm. And the parents would boast that, oh, he goes to college. He's in first year college. Mm -hmm. And we would be doing the intelligence testing and the domains, the different cognitive domain testing. And we'd find that the IQ was coming in the mildly challenged range. And we also found that even in the cognitive test, he was really underperforming. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and the parents would be saying he functions very well. In every way, there's nothing wrong with it. It's quite good. Yeah. And then we'd sit in our meetings, case discussion meetings, and the neurologist would ask us, okay, what is the profile? And we'd say, oh, he's mildly challenged. And they would look at that person, they would ask the parents, and the parents would say, no, he's perfectly fine, he's in college. <laughs> so there is this whole thing about the quality of education. Right, right. When they were coming from the rural education system, the quality of education is not up to the mark. And they were doing quite okay by that standard. Right. And in their simplistic lifestyles, they were performing all right. right. But on our tests, and if you were using college norms, they were coming up completely in bed. But if I use the school norms for them, mm. I could get the profile. Mm. So the judgment of what norms do I use for a particular individual became very important. It's a clinical decision. Mm. The other extreme which was interesting for me in private practice was mm. that we had ladies, I, I remember these ladies, a couple of them came to me, who were from highly sophisticated urban Mumbai yeah. from extremely wealthy families who had traveled internationally all over the world, so very sophisticated. Mm. But because they came from an era, these were elderly women, era where women were not allowed to study. No. They were from affluent families, but not allowed to study. They came presenting with complaints, which clearly I felt that they were beginning a dementia. Mm. But on the testing, if I use the school norms for them, mm. you know, they were passing those tests. They were doing well on the tests. Mm. Because of their level of sophistication right. and right. exposure and everything. Right. But if I used college norms for them, because when I communicated with them, I felt that their level was of that, mm -hmm. level of their exposure and travel. And if I used the college norms, I got the right proof. Wow. How? <laughs> In the diversity, yeah. with the languages, with the socioeconomic status, the exposure, the education systems, yeah. We have to really use our clinical judgment as to what norms we would use. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it, it looks like right from like the entire spectrum, right? Right from the time you kind of see the you know patient or the participant, the rapport building to the time you you know interpret, you know, select the norms and interpret the results. It just looks like you know you have to use your clinical judgment 
you know, a lot. And, and you know, that's that's kind of really fascinating in, in terms of the U.S. where I think it's a little more, uh, you know, we use our judgment, but it's a little more easier because I think we don't see this level of diversity that you're kind of talking about. And, you know, I can only imagine it's, it's on a day-to-day basis, not even like once in a while kind of a situation. So, um, oh, wow. It's 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 uh, so important uh, to kind of uh, be astute in that sense um, politically. I think, you know, you kind of mentioned epilepsy, um, you know, in, in your response, you kind of gave that fantastic example uh, in the previous question, uh, you know, and, and, you know, I know you work a lot with epilepsy and, and, you know, we know there's also a lot of stigma, which is attached to epilepsy, especially in South Asians. Um, can you offer us some helpful tips or guidance on you know, how do we handle, um, you know, cases of uh, epilepsy, especially in Asian Indians? So my, my work in the last 20 years has been mainly with epilepsy. And stigma has been a huge thing. And I've been deeply involved with support groups, deeply involved with doing awareness programs for epilepsy. So in India, there is this culture and belief systems about epilepsy, which has been with us for hundreds of years and has not changed. And that is, um, it still exists in rural India to a large extent. It's changing in the cities. But there are two or three things. One is there's a belief that it's like a possession syndrome, like possession by evil spirits, the, the seizures. There's also some people believe that it's like a punishment for past actions, unfortunately. There is that whole karmic kind of feelings and belief systems that are there. And then there is also because of the odd behaviors that we see during the seizure, there's a sense of shame because there's very poor knowledge about epilepsy. Mm. Now it's like a vicious cycle. What happens is that people hide. I mean, the families will always tell the patient or tell their loved one not to disclose about their seizures mm. because it is poorly understood and because of the stigma and wrong misconcepts and uh, myths about epilepsy in the country. Mm -hmm. So the people tend to hide because between seizures, you are normal. Yeah. So they are able to hide it very often. Mm -hmm. Now, this lack of disclosure or hiding it makes it like a, what I call a closet illness. So it's hidden. Mm -hmm. And because it is hidden and no one talks about it, the knowledge continues to be less. So it's a vicious cycle. Mm -hmm. So there's less knowledge. People don't know about it. And when they see it or hear about it, they have the wrong ideas and about it and it's kind of this what happens during a seizure is quite frightening for people and they continue to shun it then and the stigma remains with us. Why is this perceived stigma so important and why is it still continuing and why is it such a big problem for us is because it impacts three things. One is your education. We still have reports, not so much now because we've done a lot of awareness of children being kept out of schooling or the school authorities saying that don't bring him back till the seizures stop. So being marginalized from education. We have examples of when they seek a job and if they admit that they have epilepsy, they're not given the jobs. We're doing a study right now about employment and epilepsy at the national level to understand the issues. But I want to just quickly talk about, because we have limited time, about marriage and epilepsy. Now, you will think, what's a big deal about marriage? But it's the key factor why people from South Asian countries hide about their epilepsy. Hmm. Realize that in India, over 95% and maybe even more, much more, almost 100% of the people have arranged marriages. Hmm. So estimated over 95%. Yeah. And marriage is the center core of the being in an Indian society. You have to get married. Hmm. Big thing. Hmm. And with these arranged marriages, if you know about a person having epilepsy or a seizure, they are rejected right away. Mm. Proposal never goes through. Mm. So marriage, you're completely, you don't, you miss out on that opportunity of marriage. So we have a number of cases where people hide the fact that they have epilepsy and don't want to talk about it because they know they'll never have an opportunity to marry. The tragedy is that because they hide, and they get married. Many of these cases also end up with separation and divorce because mm. at some point later on, the family finds out. So to counter that, so I just want to say that in the West, if you find that you have people who have epilepsy and they 
don't want to talk too much about it or disclose it to others or bring it out socially. One of the key factors is the marriage factor. Yeah. And to counter that, it's very interesting. I don't think this has happened in any other part of the world. That we had created a national expert group, which was of the neurologists. And I was part of that group as a neuropsychologist. And we had a whole day workshop and we came up with two papers we published in Epilepsy and Behavior too. Talking about arranged marriages, oh, wow. epilepsy, and stigma. So we had to come up with guidelines yeah. so that the neurologists, when they have clients, are able to guide their patients about what they should do, when to disclose during an arranged marriage, how much to disclose, who to disclose to. We have guidelines. Wow. And these are national guidelines? I mean, we're bringing it out as a, we've done two papers now. But we would like to bring it out as a national guideline to be yeah. really able to tell people what you do because it's a huge problem. Wow. So we're doing awareness programs, you know, yeah. and uh, it's very interesting that when you were talking about projects and I had no, I mean, I've talked too much about the projects, but a very recent thing that it's ongoing right now is this whole pandemic was like a silver lining because we could do things online. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. in the past, we decided to target school teachers and school children because they are the future generation. Yeah. or awareness about epilepsy and mm -hmm. to destroy these myths and misconceptions. Mm -hmm. So we had to go from school to school in person, which was really very difficult for all of us. This time we went online and we joined hands with the government. And in the last three months, we have already educated about 5,000 government teachers. Wow, that's amazing. Every week we do two parallel sessions with three, 400 school teachers coming on. And uh, when we talk about telling neuropsychology, you know, we've learned now how to do it online. And these are government school teachers from remote areas who are using just their smartphones and coming on to Zoom. And we started this awareness education program. Our target is 10,000 teachers in the next few months. Nice. Wow. That's yeah. uh, a lofty target, but I, I think you're, you know, are you almost there? Like, do you all have numbers in terms of uh, how many? Teachers have been already trained? Yeah. So, I mean, we have to get rid of the stigma because it's really destroying lives in many ways. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, can you walk us through a typical case? Like, what are the kind of patients you see clinically? What are some of the challenges uh, you face when you see them? So, um, you have to uh, realize that we've we see a large number of different types of cases, you know. It's because if I tell you the ratio of neuropsychologists in the country to the general population, it's been estimated as 1 is to 26 million people. So there's one neuropsychologist <laughs> for 26 million. <laughs> about 50 of us in the whole country. So as a result, we don't have much of a choice in selecting the kind of cases or doing niche kind of work. We have we become more generalist. We work from pediatrics to geriatrics, all kinds, mm -hmm. adult, pediatric, geriatrics. Yeah. And we go across. But I'd like to tell you that in India, what has been the pattern of reference? Mm -hmm. And we're dependent on our neurology and neurosurgery colleagues for the reference. Mm -hmm. So the reference that have come in typically are in three broad categories. One is epilepsy surgery, surgery work. Mm -hmm. So both for epilepsy surgery and in recent years, we've been getting a lot of reference for TBS, deep brain stimulation in Parkinson's patients. And so the pre-surgical and post-surgical evaluations. Mm -hmm. We also get um, referrals for neuro rehabilitation. In fact, that's where neuropsychology really began mm -hmm. to do traumatic brain injury and uh, hypoxic brain injury and other brain injury rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. And the third is the diagnostic aspects for dementia. As I told you about the projects, yeah. So diagnosis for MCI, early, and the types of dementia, that's the kind of work. Mm -hmm. So broadly, these are three categories. If you ask neuropsychologists in the country, they're working. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in these three types, if we see a case, and I see across these three types, mm -hmm. uh, the method, the evaluation protocols are a little different. Mm -hmm. So for the surgery cases, we have a fixed battery approach, mm -hmm. which we've created a fixed battery, domain-specific testing. Yeah. And we stick to two tests at least per domain in a proper way. And it's a very long four to six hours, sometimes two sessions, but at least one long session with breaks four to five hour battery. And uh, for the neurorehabilitation part of it, 
Mm. That's a more flexible approach. Mm. Because in this, we go into the history, mm. clinical history, the kind of injury. Mm. We also go into the investigations, the MRI. Mm. And here, uh, when we work in a multidisciplinary team, we are following, of course, the ICF model, which is the International Classification of Function, Disability. Mm. And for that ICF model framework, Mm-hmm. We try to evaluate not only the impairments with our test, mm-hmm. but we do look at scales and other information we can bring in about activity, participation, environmental, family support, family factors. Mm-hmm. So it's flexible, individualized. When we do neuro rehab, to draw up a profile of strengths and difficulties. Okay. In the dementia diagnosis, we have typically so far used mainly only the screening tools because we never had a battery with norms for the elderly. Mm-hmm. Only now, with the ICMR battery coming up, we'll have a more extensive toolbox for the elderly and dementia diagnosis. Mm-hmm. There we have the screening tools, mm-hmm. but then we'll have a mood evaluation. We we'll have the NPI, which we do with the families. We we'll have the CDR. So yeah. we do a kind of a holistic kind mm-hmm. of a thing. And for all these evaluations, clinical evaluation, the clinical histories is very important. Yeah. So this is how we go about. It takes about four to six hours and we break up the sessions. And the most important thing is that's not where we end. It's not mm-hmm. just the evaluation. At least I personally, mm-hmm. I personally definitely do this, that I have many sessions subsequently for yeah. psychoeducation, for explaining the report mm-hmm. and for counseling, which I think is the most important part for our families who very poorly understand this brain behavior relationship. Yeah. Yeah. I spend a lot of time with that. Yeah. And, and and you mentioned that, you know, you kind of take about sometimes one to two sessions for testing, so do, for like feedback, counseling, the family, uh, you know, do you take one whole session for that? Yes, I take one, uh, not only one session, I take several sessions. Mm. So when you talk about challenges, you know, when you were saying that, what are the kind of challenges? I spoke about a lot of challenges when I discussed the project. Yeah. But I think uh, one challenge, which I would say we have, I think two challenges for me. One is with the client or the patient, the devaluation that they have about your psychology. We have to struggle through making them understand why this is a valuable, uh, you know, evaluation time for them. Why is that valuable for them? Yeah. So it, that's been quite challenging to bring about that change in the mindset of people about what are they doing there, sitting with paper, pencil, battery tests, why are you asking me all these kind of questions? Right, right. The second most important thing is the family. Mm-hmm. So in India, I'm extremely uh, proud of the fact that we are a very family-oriented society because the family is the pillar of strength and support in our communities. Yeah. But the same family can be also a barrier. Right. So in evaluations, what happens, we find that the families, number one is that they also interfere at multiple levels. So first is even when we are doing the report or we are interpreting the results and we want to talk to them, they will decide whether the client will get the information or not. Mm -hmm. So the client doesn't have the autonomy to decide to know about his health. The family sort of takes over to decide how much will be shared or not shared. Also, when it comes to rehabilitation in the goal setting exercise, we find that the families are more uh, controlling and dominating about what should be pre- prioritized in terms of the goals in rehabilitation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Also, we find that later on, the families are overprotective and don't allow the client to become independent. Mm-hmm. They want to look after. That deep sense of wanting to look after the person sometimes becomes a barrier for optimal rehabilitation. So these are some of the challenges we have to work through to in our cases on a day day basis. Yeah, yeah, and, and and I think it's very unique when you mentioned that you know you call back the families and you know, for counseling feedback not just once but you know over multiple <laughs> sessions. Yeah, so it's a, yeah, you're seeing like the whole range almost of like from the diagnostic formulation to like the rehab and you know the follow through, which kind of makes it so whole, very holistic approach. Yeah, it's not just psychometrics; it's just on the numbers and the scores that are there in a in a report. It has all the aspects of it. We, by the end of that um, interaction with that group, that person and his family or her family, you just feel like you know everything about them holistically. Yeah, yeah, 
yeah, that's that's I think that that's what makes you a true psychologist, right? Like in the true sense of the word, you're not just seeing the scores and like one aspect of it, you're seeing everything about them and their lives and their families too in this case, which is I think India. Um, you, you know, I'm, I'm going to kind of um, come to the last uh, couple of questions that I have, which are a little more personal. Um, you know, and I think this is probably like on top of my list at least. Who has been the most influential in your life? Um, from for for your cultural and your professional identity, like what is it that you really appreciated about them? I think uh, cultural identity. If I had to speak about first, I would think of my parents, and uh, they instilled in me a deep sense of pride about being Indian. Yeah. I think it was through their sharings of our culture, our history our ancient wisdom, the scriptures, through multiple modes, uh, that I grew up with this very strong sense of pride about my country and its culture and the diversity, and the diversity particularly. Yeah. Yeah. And I think my father also instilled in me this whole sense of uh, not being just this, the, being beyond the individual, that we have this interconnectedness yeah. sense of interconnectedness, which is very typical of our culture. Yeah. The inter interdependency. Yeah. And therefore, always to be able to think of others along with yourself you're there, but always the thought of the community yeah. of people and the sense of family. Yeah. And I think this cultural identity of the family, which is such a strong element in our culture in India, at all levels, in every way, that this family part and the family support my, that was further strengthened in my identity when I got married. And I think the next person who really influenced me in many ways is my own husband. And uh, he's a surgeon. And I spent most of my career in the, uh, I think up to my mid-career, almost till recently, I had to work pro bono quite a bit. Mm. Because there was no understanding of neuropsychology. There were no places, there were no centers, no jobs. I had to create that. Yeah. Yeah. And he has been a pillar of support. And then I made me realize the sense of family support that comes in, in India. Yeah. Even when you have to work professionally, it's really enormous. It's huge. Yeah. Yeah. Then, of course, at a professional, for my professional identity, it was shaped initially by my teachers. And I'll name two right now. There have been many teachers, but Dr. Khatri was my guide for my PhD work. And Dr. Shobhani Rao was the pioneer of neuropsychology in India. She was my examiner and my mentor, both professionally and personally. So I owe a lot of my understanding of neuropsychology and my work and my care for the patients. That learning happened through them. Yeah. Then, of course, the colleagues and my senior neurologist and the other neuro neurologist colleagues, neurosurgeons, who were open enough to accept and understand a new discipline. They didn't know about this. But there was an openness, not only an openness, but a great support. And also the kind of sharing we had, the neurologists and the, you know, understanding neuropsychology, the brain, the brain behavior aspects, that has been huge in kind of shaping me professionally and helping me out to develop the field over here. Yeah. And last, but I think the most important, and that's why I didn't say not least, but most important for me has been the patients and their families. So I think they form the center of my professional identity. Yeah. They are my role models. Yeah. I've always said that. They were, they are, and they always will. Yeah. I have been deeply influenced and inspired by their grit, by their determination, by their ability. You have, I, I'm always sharing that my work has been with the low-income group. It's about their ability to handle adversity with dignity. Mm -hmm. And the family members of how they care for their loved ones and how they handhold them mm -hmm. and protect them. So it's been deeply inspiring. And I'm really grateful that I had this opportunity in my life to work with this section of society. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And, and, and I love the fact that you kind of acknowledged how they handle adversity with dignity. I mean, that's really going to stick on to me forever. Like, it's, it's so powerful to kind of hear you say that. How can the rest of us in the larger a, &A community uh, help to support the work that you do? How can we be more involved and, you know, just be there and learn from you? 
Speaking first of all, I want to really thank the end. I'm uh, truly grateful that we did this interview and I had an opportunity to share some of my personal observations. But these are personal observations, they are anecdotes. I think we need research. Mm. And we need a lot more work in terms of evidence yeah. and research to make us understand really what is the contribution of culture to shaping the brain. When we talk about the brain, we know about that there's software and hardware the way I look at it. So you are hardwired, so to say. You, you know, in the principle of universalism, as we say, that we all come with the same neuroanatomical substrates and the brain is the same structure right. and the organ. But how does this wiring occur in the brain? Mm. We know about the influences of education and other factors, but I think culture plays a huge, huge part. Yeah. And I have always, I didn't talk about this, but I've been fascinated with illiteracy. And, uh, you know, when we, there is illiteracy and yet you see people having high levels of occupational complexity. Yeah. So in our country, for example, we have people in rural India who are absolutely illiterate, but of the highest skill as far as being artisans, whether it is in music, whether it's in embroidery, whether it's in craft, I mean, the levels that they achieve. And then you hear on the other side that cognitive reserve happens only by formal education. Right. Right. But the Western evidence is suggesting. Yeah. I really feel that we need more research to understand how the brain can also get wired to very high levels of cognitive reserve, yeah. not necessarily by formal education, but by other means. Yeah. And what are these cultural components? Is it because we turmeric and because that's been said and because we are multilingual that we are protected from dementia yeah. in India? Is it really true? Or is there something else happening that we are not reporting the dementia? Families are not coming forward with the cases. Yeah. What is truly happening? And I, I feel this research about talking, promoting brain health. Mm. So we focus on the damaged brain. Yeah. But I think neuropsychology has to turn to look at how do you promote good brain health. Mm. And that's where cross-cultural or cultural neuropsychology will come in. Yeah. Where we learn from the different cultures yeah. about protective factors, about lifestyles, about food, about other elements, about how cognition and how processing occurs in the brain in different cultures. Yeah. That will strengthen the brain, protect it, or will damage the brain. Yeah. And for this kind of work, it's the a, &A. If there is a collaboration, if there is conversations, yeah. if there is sharing, if there is funding, right. and we can work together in looking at this science and this evidence, yeah. I think we have a lot to contribute to neuropsychology. I think the a, a has an extremely important role because Asian cultures have not been studied so far. So, yeah. Yeah. And of course, we would welcome in India some mentoring by all of you. You know, many of you Indian neuropsychologists, they come and visit India. So do come and teach us, train us, mentor us and help us. And we'll share our experiences and we can grow together. Yeah. And that is, that is, I think, perfect in terms of just, uh, you know, concluding this talk and, and kind of how we really uh, need to kind of develop these bridges across cultures and kind of really help neuropsychology grow um, and, and kind of really inform the field that it's not just about uh, education, for example, it could be a lot of other things, as you're rightly saying, and that can only come into our uh, understanding into the field by kind of doing more cross-cultural work. So um, thank you. Thank you for sharing your knowledge, your wealth of wisdom. Um, and yeah. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for this lovely, lovely evening for me and morning for you. And thank you to the ANA for this great opportunity. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you.